What is up, guys? Welcome on into Pixwise Playbook presented by Superbook Sports. This is week three edition. Lauren Jabara with Jared Smith, Tank Williams. Jared, how are you? We're getting into week three. Some crazy things that we've seen so far. Like the Jets to win a game where they trailed by 13 points. And I think there was 95 seconds remaining in the game, but that's the world that we live in. We had insane comebacks across the board. We've had overtime. We've had ridiculous turnovers. We, I mean, we've had pretty much everything you can ask for in two weeks, but we're only 10% of the way into the season. So buckle up, baby, because <laughs> week three. Buckle we up. <laughs> I absolutely love it. Tank Williams, we are past week one where there's overreaction. You get into week two where teams kind of level out week three. We might see like what we're actually going to expect from some of these teams this season. How are you? How have you been through two weeks now? We're getting into week three of NFL. You know, I'm good right now. But the one thing I'm worried about is the Indianapolis Colts. Like, did these cats really have to press the <laughs> life alert button on their necklace already like two weeks into the season? Like, I really don't know what's going on, but there's no way I expected them to go in the Jacksonville <laughs> and get pummeled by the Jags like that. Like, I feel like... If they didn't need it already, they need to go and watch that New Orleans Saints game against Tampa Bay, see how that Mike Evans and Marshawn Lattimore dust up occurred, like bottle that stuff up, put it on some ice, and then inject it into their veins and make sure they come out with something this week because, ooh, going against the Kansas City Chiefs, if they come in with that same energy as Jacksonville, it's going to get ugly fast. I'll make a bet with you, Tank. Not how about this? By the <laughs> end of it, the guys. show, by the end of the show, I'm going to get you to believe in the Colts this week. I'm going to get you to be a believer. Go work my magic. Ooh, only if Jonathan Taylor runs for like 200 yards. If he runs for 200 uh, yards. Hey, maybe I that's part it. of the equation there. Maybe that's part of it. But there's some other things I'm interested in your take on on the defensive side, which I know is your specialty, but I'm curious your thoughts. So we'll get there. We'll we're okay. we're going to get into the okay. Colts in a second. That's, that's what we call a tease. <laughs> We're teasing before. you for ahead of the show. We have a lot to get into today. Some really big matchups. But first of all, let's go through Tank's just repertoire, if we will. Because this guy is an absolute beast. Talking about slinging tackles, absolutely making an impact on the field. Went to college at Stanford. First team all Pac-10 in 2001. First team all American in 2001. Ooh, Second team all Pac-10 in 2000. Played for the Titans <laughs> 2002 to 2005. I can't forget the All-American. Come on now, guys. How could I even forget? The All-American um, boy. The 06 to 07 and the Pats 08 to 09. Tank, what is going on with your Tennessee Titans right now? I mean, Ooh. there's something there's something in the water down there in Nashville. That's so really, you're going to start the show off like that? Well. Really? That's how you're going to come out? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Doing him dirty <laughs> out there. That is Man, tough. You go through all these real. nice things and it's least, just, oh. Right? <laughs> At least let me put my helmet on first. Uh, I mean, if you want to get right down to it, the issue with the Tennessee Titans is this. They're playing their best ball when King Henry is stiff arming the soul out of everybody that's trying to touch him. And they really can't do that on offense right now because you know who they're missing? They're missing that dog, A.J. Brown, on the outside. Like, every time I see A.J. Brown step between the white lines and he catches the ball, I just see more of saying, you are the father because he owns every defensive back that's been lined up against him so far this season. And, and that's the thing, like the Titans need Burks to step up on the outside, become a playmaker. Then that takes an extra man out the box. Then King Henry can do what he does. And then the Titans offense will flow, but the offense isn't trucking. And then therefore it's putting a lot of stress on the defense. And then now you just see where our entire team implodes because one segment of the team isn't carrying that load. Mm. I know King Henry needs to find his crown and pick it up and put it on his head and get it oh. moving for week three because the Tennessee Titans need to get themselves going if they want to give themselves a chance to finish at the top of the division. But you look at the week two betting stats. Straight up, the favorites were nine and six. Over under went five, ten, and one. And against the spread, nine, five, and one. So let's look back at week two before we fast forward to week three. For me, some of my takeaways, the Dolphins looked really good. They were trailing 21 points in the fourth quarter. Um, and I looked up this stat on NFL.com. Trailing it by 21 points in the fourth, the Dolphins are O, or teams in general are O and 710 since 2011. No team has ever come back 21 points in the fourth quarter to come back and win a game. Tua looked elite. Jalen Waddle, Tyreek went off. Um, 
And then I look at the Cardinals. How did they win that game? They were down 20 to nothing. The Raiders, I looked this up on NFL.com too. 39 and 0 when leading by 29, 20 at half. Cardinals, 0 and 90 when trailing by 20 at half. There's a first time mm -hmm. for everything, guys. And that's pretty crazy mm -hmm. that that happened. But the 49ers, Jimmy G, no Trey Lance, no problem. Lions and Jets, not the same old Lions and Jets, which we love to see. Um, who are the Jaguars at this point? The top of the AFC South. Who are the Giants? 2-0 and to start the season. There's just some crazy things that we've been seeing so far through two weeks that we didn't necessarily expect to see. Jared, I'm going to come to you first. What was your biggest surprise coming out of week two now heading into, heading into the third week of the NFL season? Well, well, you went through a lot there. Let me see if I can digest that. I know. I'm that, sorry. Right? I just I get excited. I get excited. <laughs> she was firing yeah. off the hot takes tank. I right. gotta get I gotta get my yeah. mind right now. Okay. I would say the biggest individual surprise, like I cannot believe that this one thing happened was the Jets coming back from a 13 point lead with a minute 30 to go. I, I just and maybe that's my personal bias as a Jets fan for 36 years speaking, but we're usually on the other end of, of those types of performances. So and I don't really want to give the Jets all the credit. It was a lot of mental, yeah. you know, brain farts by the Browns, Kareem Hunt. And Nick Chubb being the two big, the, the, the big ones. And it's funny because Chubb had a chance last year in the same situation against the Texans to score a touchdown in the final minute or two and, you know, give Houston a chance to come back. But he did the smart thing last year, went down. It was a fantasy football, you know, uh, you know, a big controversy last year. This year he decided he wanted mm -hmm. the touchdown. So he clearly is, is aware of the moment because he was in the same moment last year and he did the right thing. And this year, exact same moment. And he, pick the wrong door so i that's the part about the browns that i think you need to see a little bit more awareness because if they if when deshaun watson comes back they have division title super bowl aspirations they're not going to get there if they're not all on the same page making the right football decision so while that shocking comeback by the jets was awesome from a jets fans perspective if you're a cleveland browns fan or executive or you know teammate in that locker room you you, you want to see them make the right moves going forward because the Browns do have very high expectations and that was not becoming of what Cleveland's, you know, win total should be this year based off of what we saw on Sunday. Yeah, absolutely. Tank, I know you mentioned the Colts already, but please dive into them a little mm -hmm. bit more because none of us would <laughs> thought they'd be where they are in their division after two weeks heading into the season. You know, now I'm just feeling like I'm a, a Colts hater since I'm a former Titan. So I feel like I can beat up on them and I'm we're probably going to beat up on them when we talk about the Chiefs matchup. So, you know, I'm going to switch it up a little bit. I'm going to throw a little curveball. Oh, I'm going to bring up the Arizona Cardinals. And it's, and it's for this reason yeah. only, because we talked about how bad the Arizona Cardinals were in week one and how the Kansas City Chiefs and Patrick Mahomes more specifically gave them the five fingers to the face, pop, 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 throwing five touchdowns. <laughs> and for them to be down 20 to nothing, at halftime and then somehow some way come back in that game mm -hmm. like i feel like that's truly special and it may be something that sparks them for the rest of the season because i felt like arizona they really didn't have an identity they've been trying to beat things that they aren't but the one thing that makes that offense go and makes them a game changer kyler murray with his legs i mean you see it all mm -hmm. the time with jalen hurts running the ball with lamar jackson running the ball I don't know if they just wanted to prevent Colin from running because they don't want him to get hurt. But once that dude starts running around the pocket, he is uncoverable. Like the defensive backs can't cover the wide receivers that long. The defensive lineman can't catch him. He just does miraculous things. And so I feel like as long as the Arizona Cardinals integrate that into their offense moving forward, it's going to be something to look at. But that to me is also as special as the coach yeah. getting their teeth kicked in against the Jags coming back from a 20 nothing deficit at halftime. Yeah, that's crazy. And I said it a little bit earlier, too. So down 20 to nothing, the Raiders are 39 and 0 when leading by 20 at half. The Cardinals 0 and 90 when trailing by 20 at half. It is crazy that they broke that streak. They were able to get it done. That was just a wild ending to the game. Hunter Renfro obviously fumbling. We're not used to seeing him do that. But honestly, OK, Tank, I have a question for you just from a player's perspective. When, when a guy like Hunter Renfro has the ball and he's spinning and he gets, a, he gets a helmet right into the ball, there's no physical way for a guy to actually hold on to that thing, right? I mean, I know you were the guy doing the tackling, but like, there's no physical way no. to actually hold on to that ball. I mean, they teach you the points of pressure, like the way to carry the ball to try to prevent as many turnovers as possible. 
But right now, the way the game is taught from a young age, like the defensive players are taught to try to target the ball any way possible. Mm -hmm. So they're punching the ball. They're putting helmets on the ball. And so the way that they attack the ball right now, I mean, that was the perfect way to get the ball out. And and if you notice, like, Renfro fumbled earlier in the game. I don't know if it was that same drive yeah. or was the it was drive the, It was back-to-back back play. It was the same time. drive, I think. Back-to-to-back back plays, I thought right? it was yeah. the play before. Maybe there was one play yeah. in between. I mean, so, it was on that drive for sure. Yeah, I mean, so the way that they're attacking the ball, like, it's no, it's no surprise. It's no joke. Like, defensive players are, like, missling in on the ball, and they're becoming quite effective at it. And so that should be in the psyche of all these offensive players now that you have to protect the ball first and foremost because these ball hawks are going after it. Mm. Yeah, you got to protect the biscuit, baby. Put the biscuit in the basket, hold on to that thing, and get going. <laughs> Not that I've, I mean, I've never been tackled in my I'm life, hungry. so I can't say that. I feel like I'd fumble the ball too, but, you know. It's okay. <laughs> okay, let's get into some MVP candidates because there's a lot of them going around the league right now. First of all, let's focus on on Patrick Mahomes. Um, his odds right now are five to one. The Chiefs taking on the Colts this week. Jared, just your thoughts on on MVP candidates in general and, and Patrick Mahomes' odds at this point. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the market is kind of giving you the tears, as they say, as we now get to week three. You know, I, I think you put Mahomes in that top tier. You put Josh Allen in that top tier, and and I'll be honest, I, I think there's a pretty big gap between those two guys and the rest of the league in terms of MVP consideration. I think there's a couple mm-hmm. guys that are floating in the middle, second tier. Lamar, obviously. Jalen Hurts, obviously. Justin Herbert. I think those are the three quarterbacks that would maybe be in that second tier. At least that's what the market is telling me. Aaron Rodgers and Tom Brady, because of their status in the league, I think they're going to have to have exceptional seasons to be crowned MVP. Mm -hmm. And I just don't see that happening, especially with Brady. All the weapons are hurt. Aaron Rodgers has got a bunch of weapons that are out too. And, you know, no, no Devontae Adams this year. And then you've got kind of the wild cards in that mix. I would say Kyler Murray, Russell Wilson. uh, And I don't want to put Tua in there, but you have to after a six touchdown game. But I would Mm -hmm. lean more to the Kyler and the Russell because of what they can do with their legs and because of their upside. So to me, Josh Allen is clearly the MVP front runner and the market's telling us that. But I would make you can make a really strong case for Patrick Mahomes just because the Chiefs maybe were a little bit undervalued heading into the season. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Josh Allen odds at this point are four to one. Lamar Jackson twelve to one. Justin Herbert eight to one, and Rodgers and Brady are both at eighteen to one at this point. Tank, when you look at the MVP market after two weeks, heading into Week Three, who would you say is your top one or two favorites? You can't go against Josh Allen, can you? Yeah, it's hard to go against Josh Allen. I mean, he has Stephon Diggs playing at a high level. That offense is just churning. The one thing I was worried about with Allen is coming down the stretch playing in that weather in Buffalo and some of the other weather that they have to face, whether they're playing some teams in AFC East or AFC North. I thought that they may slow him down down the stretch. That's why I was kind of leaning towards Justin Herbert being a dark horse. But now with him having mm. the banged up ribs, I'm not exactly yeah. sure how that's going to play out. But I think one guy that we need to keep our eye on, because we've already seen this blueprint happen before, Jalen Hurts. Like, if you look at Jalen Hurts, what they're doing with him in Philadelphia is eerily similar to what the Ravens are doing with my man Lamar Jackson. Like, that's a run-heavy offense mm-hmm. right there where they predominantly run the ball. Everyone has to focus on trying to take away the run. And with him running the ball so effectively, they get an extra blocker in that standpoint. And then you have A.J. Brown, Devontae Smith, Dallas Goddard, one of the better tight ends in the league. Like, they're eating people up from all phases of the game and on offense. And so I feel like if they can continue this run, Jalen Hurts is going to be a dog horse for the MVP race. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree with you on that. Did you see Tank and Jared? I mentioned this to Jared this morning, but did you see Tank that in the broadcast, they had a video of Jalen Hurts in college squatting 600 pounds? And then one of the announcers, I can't remember who it was, goes, and that begs the question, yeah. why? <laughs> and why? it's actually like, exactly. why are you trying to squat 600 why? pounds? It's, it's, that's just yeah. insane. How many pounds did you squat back in the day, Tank? Oh, boy, here we go. Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> no, no, it's not here we go because – I didn't even want to put that much on my back. Like we used to do this back in the yeah. days where we would do we would do like three reps or something, and then you have to use that to calculate what your one rep max would be. I'm not trying to put five yeah. six hundred pounds on my back and talk about squatting it. Like every damn ligament in my body are probably here's the difference. So, <laughs> here's the difference. Social media didn't exist. 
these days, that's why they do it. They yeah, want you do attention. some crazy things with social media, right? <laughs> yeah, look at the, the, the chicken NyQuil challenge. I mean, these kids are nuts these days, so they'll do anything. Yeah. They'll do anything to get their that attention was... on social media. And that was at a time when he was trying to become a draft pick. You know, that was during his Oklahoma days. So he was trying to boost his draft profile. I, I agree with you. I don't know why they're doing that. That doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't it's make crazy. Sense. That was just my favorite. Exactly. Yeah. As an yeah. offensive lineman, I can kind of understand it, but I got a quarterback. Like, yeah. like you can barely get a quarterback to lift a weight in the weight room. You they're doing band work. This dude got six hundred pounds on his back. Like hanging on. out with the kickers down on the uh, side of the field. Yeah, there, so right? these quarterbacks right? are curling like twenty pound dumbbells, and you have Jalen Hurts over here squatting six hundred lbs. Wild. Wild. Oh my gosh! But that's neither here nor there. So now we know that Jalen Hurts can squat six hundred pounds, and oh. he's also beast. He's so happy on the football that. field too. So good for him. I feel like anyone that could squat 600 is is worthy of winning the MVP for a year. Who knows? We'll see how that plays out heading into week three. It's going to be exciting to watch the Eagles this week. Um, a game that I'm looking forward to seeing. Let's get into some of these key matchups heading into week three. The Saints taking on the Panthers. NFC South rivals. Going head to head, the Saints dropped week two to the Bucks. They allowed 17 points in the fourth quarter. A lot of Saints turnovers were the difference in that game, and that had to do with the Bucks defense. They they forced three interceptions, two fumbles, um, and the Panthers also coming off the loss. They haven't won, guys, since week 10 of the 2021 season. How good do you think that feels in the locker room? Not. Um, Christian McCaffrey was probably the only bright spot for their team in that game, 102 rushing yards. Baker... Mm, wasn't very good. 14 of 29, 145 yards, one touchdown. I'm really interested to see how this game is going to go. Jared, when you look at the Saints taking on the Panthers, what is the biggest thing that stands out to you that you're going to be looking for heading into this week? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. Carolina's defense has not played well. I think that's something I'd like to see improvement with. They've been average, but again, with the Matt Rule unit, with all the draft picks they've spent and some of the additions, I, I would expect Carolina's defense to be in the top third, you know, at least of the league, if not in the top 10, they haven't quite ascended to that category yet. I think when you look mm -hmm. at the Saints, it's it's all about the health of Jameis Winston. Last week was the rib, right, the rib or the back or something. Like, what, what what's his situation this week? I'll tell you what, Chris Olave looks like an absolute rock star. I think he mm -hmm. led the league in air yards, uh, and he leads the league currently in air yards through two weeks. That's a category for him and for Jameis and for the ability to stretch teams out, you've got Thomas and Landry kind of in that slot over the middle role that have been fantastic. And then you add Olave to the mix to be able to stretch the field. That just makes the Saints offense so much da more dangerous. They will be without – I did. I saw uh, Evans got suspended. Did Lattimore get suspended too? I don't know if I saw no. that or not. So they'll have Lattimore this yeah, week, you would think. Lattimore's going to play this week. That's big because Baker's a guy that – you know, keys yeah. in on his receivers. Uh, and and you would expect a guy like Marshawn Lattimore against a very good Carolina wide receiver group. I mean, they've got some dudes out there with Anderson and Moore and, of course, Christian McCaffrey in the backfield. Very, very solid offensive unit. But is Baker really going to be able to trigger? Um, he's at home. That helps. But the Saints defense is, I would say, a top five unit in the league. And I, I, I'm not betting this game, but you can see based on the total that there's not going to be a lot of points scored. So this is going to be one of those slobber knocker kind of NFC South games. And I think New Orleans' defense is playing a little bit better right now. And that's why they're a road fan. Tank, New Orleans is 5-1 and one straight up in its last six games against Carolina. And Jameis Winston's going to want to get his team back in the win column after losing to Tom Brady last week. What do you think the Saints need to do to be able to do that? I think really the key to this game and for any Saints game is like Jameis, be Jameis, but don't be Jameis. Does that make sense? Like be able to yeah, distribute the it ball. Does, actually. You, you have a strong <laughs> arm. You have a strong arm. You can air it out like you can air it out like none other, but just don't turn the damn ball over. Like whenever Jameis throws interceptions, whether it's because he's making crazy throws or whether it's because the offensive line is giving up a lot of pressure, the Saints just seem not unravel. I mean, if you look at it before he had those turnovers, like the Saints were right in there with the Bucks, and the Bucks defense was playing some of the best ball that I've seen to date this year. But the mm -hmm. one thing, man, Carolina's offense, like the one way you could describe Baker Mayfield so far is like he's been basic Baker. Like he's been really basic. Yeah. There's nothing that really stands out. You have Christian McCaffrey. You have my man DJ Moore. You have Robbie Anderson. That's a deep threat. They've actually connected on the deep pass in week one. I mean, you have enough weapons to have some, you know, 
explosiveness on the offensive side of the ball. But as long as you're calling basic plays, you're going to get basic production. So some of that's on Matt Rule, and then the rest of it is going to be on Baker, making sure he gets the ball in the hands of his playmakers and let them do work. And if he can do that, and then, you know, we may – I mean, there's a slight chance. I'm not betting on it, but there's a slight chance that we can get a sneaky shootout. But a lot of things mm. have to come together for that to happen. I don't yeah. trust Baker in mean- defense. The great his grades have not been not been good. That would be the one thing I'm like, man, True. Baker. Like I don't understand why. Like why tank? It's like it's every year. New team doesn't matter. New scheme. Great players can't accuracy. Everything's just down with him. I mean, you know, like this is one game that I only had opportunity to scan through. I haven't been able to go back and watch it in its entirety. But some of the things I looked at on mm-hmm. Twitter were. There were some folks who were able to go back and watch the entire game. They said that some of the play calling has been a little bit suspect where they were running like basic route combinations on both sides of the field. And I know when I'm a defensive back and I see when wide receivers line up in certain splits and I can see the route coming before the quarterback thinks I can, then I'm going to pick the ball off. It's that plain and simple. It's all about Mm -hmm. formation recognition, route recognition. And then that allows DBs to jump and make plays. So some of this could be on Matt Rule. It's going to be interesting. I, I told Jared at the beginning of the season, I think the Matt Rule, if I could bet on him to be the first NFL coach to be fired this season, I would bet on Matt Rule. Um, I still think that that might happen. I don't know if you can play. Lay an egg at home Jared, against New Orleans, know. and then we'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah. Jared, let me know when that market's up that I can bet on Matt Rule being the first coach. It's, to be it's, fired it's, 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 away it's, it's on up now. It's just we can't bet on an onshore. It's an offshore market, but it is up now. Uh. He's up well, there on the list just for next to Hackett. I think he's going to be the first coach <laughs> to be fired. Um, coaches that I don't think are going to be fired are the coaches of the Rams and the Cardinals. Uh, both teams right now looking mm-hmm. to move to the top of the NFC West. The Rams snuck by with the win last week. Cooper Cup did what he does best, 108 yards, two touchdowns. The Cardinals were staring down a goose egg in the win column before a late comeback against the Raiders. Two-point conversion, no time left on the clock to tie it, forced overtime, and Byron Murphy recovered Hunter Renfro's fumble for a touchdown, they won. Um, that was a wild ending to the game. I know we talked about you know Hunter Renfro fumbling the ball there, but this game is gonna be really exciting between two of the best teams in the NFC West. Tank, what are your expectations heading into this one? See, you know when we were talking about this game last week, we were talking about the Rams going against the Falcons. And I was like, you know what? That looks like too many points. And the reason why is because <laughs> the Rams keep doing just stupid things. And more importantly, like yeah. it's Matthew Stafford, like Matthew Stafford, the way he plays, it reminds me of like, when you go on a diet, like you wake up in the morning and you, you get a good workout in and you feel good about yourself. You eat clean for breakfast, <laughs> eat clean for lunch. And then once dinner rolls around, you order that pizza, you go in the in the in the in the freezer and you get that Ben and Jerry's half baked ice cream, and then you get like some extra cookies and milk does on the side, and you just mess it all up. Like he'll be driving down the field, like just throwing these beautiful passes, and you like, yo, this dude is the best quarterback in the league. And then somehow he gets in the red zone or in a critical situation and then just throws the ball straight to the DB. And it's like, dog, what the hell are you looking at? And so until Matthew Stafford and the Rams get that bad juju out of their offense, they could they are continue to play in these close games where they should be blowing the team out. They don't let a team hang around mm-hmm. long enough to either cover or win the game outright when they should be blowing these teams out the water. Did I ask Let me tell you something. Yeah. <laughs> this is the same right Matthew the Stafford that we saw when he picked up the Detroit Lions. This is the same exact Matthew Stafford. He just has yeah. more weapons around him now that they can actually win a game. Because before they he's had got no more weapons, weapons and he's got a Super Bowl still ring. Throwing the picks <laughs> that'll that'll do it, right, Tank? Mm-hmm. He's got that ring. Right. He's got that ring. Right. He feels pretty good about himself. <laughs> so Tank Tank not only just cut to the core of all the problems with the Rams, but you just also nailed why I have not been I've had been basically at the same weight since, you know, college, even though I've eaten, you know, worked out a lot more <laughs> and certainly certainly eaten a lot more as well. Despite all those workouts, <laughs> doesn't matter. The food just keeps on coming. I'd rather be fat and happy than skinny and miserable. All right, speaking of fat and happy. So the Rams defense, I'll be honest. So I'm looking at their defensive numbers right now, and they're really good. That's fine. I expected their run stop win rate to be top five in the league. It is. I expected their pass rush win rate to be in the top half of the league. It is. 
But then let's go to the other side of the trenches. Their offensive line has not played well. They're a bottom half, you know, team in pass block and run block win rate. Matthew Stafford's getting knocked around a little bit. And their running game is not as crisp. So that means the play action game is not as crisp. It, and again, the Rams are going to win a ton of games because the talent is elite. But we're not talking about winning games here. We're talking about covering a road spread against a really good quarterback and a team coming off of a big win. I, this line feels a hair high at three and a half. I think at three and a half, I would lean towards the Cardinals. And I, the over, are you kidding me? The defenses, especially on the back end, have really given up some big plays. And the special teams units mm-hmm. have been average. So I, I think 48 and a half is a very low total for these two offenses. And I would probably lean towards taking the three in the hook with Arizona. The Rams, 10 and one straight up in their last 11 games against Arizona. So the Rams have the Cardinals number at this point. Let's see if they can add another little tick on there at the end of this weekend. One more key game to talk about before we get back to some of these MVP games that these MVP guys are playing in. Raiders, Titans. Battle of the bottom feeders in the divisions, baby. Something that I never thought that I would say at the beginning of the season is the Raiders and the Titans are both sitting after two weeks at the bottom of their respective divisions. Um, Tank, I know we talked about your Titans a little bit, but let's talk about the Raiders Mm -hmm. too, because obviously that was a heartbreaking loss for them last weekend. They just had it and then they just lost it. How are they going to come back this week and be able to maybe get the win, get themselves in the win column heading into week four? When you start off the season 0-2, the only way to get out, your stars have to play like stars. And that means Mm -hmm. Devontae Adams, Darren Waller, Max Crosby, um, Chandler Jones, like those dudes need to go into Tennessee in a really tough environment, and they need to eat. And that's going to be the only way for the Raiders to right the ship. Now, when I look at this game, I'm a former Tennessee Titan, but I feel like the Titans do not have enough firepower on offense to get it done. We already talked mm-hmm. about it. They need a threat on the outside in order for that offense to go, and it's really not cooking right now. But if they can protect Derek Carr enough for him to get that ball to Devontae Adams, then that should be able to seal the deal. Basically, that's it. Like, you notice when, when you watch Green Bay against Chicago, the one thing that I took away mm-hmm. from that game was that, damn, the Green Bay Packers really miss Devontae Adams. Like, yo, Derek yes. Carr, you got that dude now. He's that dude. Make sure you use him. As long as you use him, you should be winning a lot of games. Yeah. Jared, your, yeah. your, your thoughts on this one? So – there's a couple factors at play here. First of all, there's a line flip involved. The Titans were the favorite mm-hmm. last week, and now they're not. And again, not a significant line flip. It's gone from one to, to one, basically, on both sides. We're approaching a key number of three now. And if it gets to three on the Raiders' side, that's where I think you'll see some Titans money step into the market. But I, I do think Tennessee, to me, you would have to at least give them a hair of, of an edge because they're coming off of a game against the Bills defense, I think is the best defense in the league. And they were playing without Ed Oliver, and they were nasty on mm-hmm. Monday night. Um, now they face a Raiders defense that's bottom five in rushing success rate. I think Derrick Henry is going to have a little more space, and that will hopefully set up the rest of the offense. In week one, Ryan Tannehill, you're 100% right, Tank. The weapons are not there, but his efficiency was. And, you know, rising tide lifts all boats. I think we've seen good quarterbacks in the past get by with average receivers if the ball is always in the right place. It wasn't against Buffalo. That's what the Bills defense Mm -hmm. will do to you. I don't think the Raiders defense, especially on the road, is going to have that same effect. On the other side, the Raiders just have to, you know, have a very short memory because you can let a loss like that when you're up 20 to nothing at half spiral and then – turn into another bad performance the following week. Then all of a sudden, 0-2 goes to 0-3. I will say this. I was texting with another prominent, you know, NF, someone who's very plugged into the NFL handicapping world this week, and he told me that the one thing about this game, if he could sum it up in one word, desperation. Very hard to mm-hmm. handicap a yeah. game where you have two teams that are 0-2 that had high expectations coming in that are desperate to get a win. You're going to see gadgets and gizmos. Who knows what you're going to see off script here very difficult game to handicap it's going to be interesting to see how that one plays out both teams coming into it with a lot of desperation you want to know where i'm desperate to go to miami <laughs> we're going to miami oh to yeah you are oh, yeah Jeez, <laughs> patient. let's get going you love it um bill's taking out the dolphins this week 
And I said that Josh Allen's odds are actually four to one. I just looked it up. Plus 270 at this point. Two is odds to win the MVP, wow. 25 to one. Um, so good, maybe outside pick to a coming off of a game where he threw for six touchdowns, which, in my opinion, Tank, and I don't know if you agree with me here. We've seen maybe what could be the ceiling for a guy like Tua. Like, I know he's not going to be throwing six touchdowns every single week, but he is capable of doing that and playing like that. Do you think, I mean, I don't think necessarily we're going to see it against the Bills, who have the best defense, arguably, in the NFL. But who knows? It could be a good start for Tua heading into this season now with Tyreek Hill on his team, too. Yeah, I mean, after that performance against the Ravens, I refuse to call him by his given name anymore. He's no longer Tua Tagovailoa. His name from now on is Tua Montana, like because he's the king of Miami. <laughs> and when you line up with Tyreek Hill and Jalen Wild on both sides, like all he does is come to the line and say, say hello to my little friends. And then he goes to work. And it's unbelievable what a difference an offensive mind, a head coach, and you add one key piece like Tyreek Hill to the offense. It's crazy yeah. what a difference it makes. It's unbelievable. And I feel like this is going to be a really good matchup. But, I mean, Jerry hit on a really good point that he is going up against the best defense in the league with the Buffalo Bills. And then on the flip side, you're going up against the best offense with Josh Allen and Stephon Diggs. And so I feel like this is going to be the ultimate challenge for the Miami Dolphins playing this game at home after a huge emotional comeback in Baltimore, now the face where a lot of people feel is the best team in the league, which is also in your division, you have to try to come back mm -hmm. and play up to their standard once again. So this is going to be tough for them. It could be a letdown game for them, but I really hope it isn't because Tua caught so much flack this entire offseason. And for him to be able to come back in that way, I mean, it was something truly special. And so I just want to give him all his flowers, chocolates, and everything that you can give on boy right now because <laughs> he earned it. He could take some of them from Matt Stafford at this point because Stafford needs to stop eating them too and needs to eat a few more of them. Um, Jared, your expectations for this game right now, the Buffalo Bills, obviously the best team in the National Football League. I don't think anyone's arguing about that. They win this game, right? They can't lose. Oh, I mean, it's heavy. Watch these can't even get happen in these games. I don't want to put anything <laughs> past that actually any one of these teams. Um I just can't get the, the the image of my mind of Tank, you know, you know, sprawled out like Al Pacino in the hot tub. I'm gonna make like, a fifth. <laughs> like you know, you know, you know the scene I'm talking about. Tank. Um, all right, I, yeah, it's probably one of my favorite scenes in the movie. All right, um, the, 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 that Ravens Dolphins game was like a movie uh, on Sunday. I I can't put into words just how impressive. Both quarterbacks were, frankly. I mean, you know, Tua was great, yeah. but, you know, Lamar Jackson was, man, pay that man his money, too. It seems like both of those quarterbacks had something to prove in that game. And you go from yeah. that emotional high against the Ravens defense that had been had in some spots, not only last year, they had injury problems. Now you face a Bills defense that is just a completely different animal. And that this total is just through the roof. I mean, 53 and a half. I, listen, I know what the Bills just did. This is a divisional game with two defenses that are up and coming. No Byron Jones still for the Dolphins. Mm -hmm. That's a problem. This is a Dolphins defense that has been very good recently. I think when you look at the whole of the Dolphins defense, I trust them more than the Titans defense. And I have a feeling yeah. this is going to be a little bit more of a nip and tuck game. I'm not saying this doesn't get to 55, but it feels like the total is a hair elevated at 53 and a half, 54 where I would feel a little more comfortable to the under here than I would betting it over with these two defenses. Now, can Tua do it two weeks in a row? That If he can tank, you're right, Lauren, he is an MVP candidate. If he can do at least resemble the performance what he did last week against the Bills defense this week, I'm not there yet, but – if he does, I will say yes, he deserves to be in the MVP discussion if he can go blow for blow with the MVP favorite, mm -hmm. Josh Allen. No bet for me here, but mm -hmm. I will be very, very interested in watching this game because I think it's going to speak volumes about where the Dolphins especially go moving forward. If they win this game, they're a Super Bowl contender. I, I, I think that to me yeah. is, is, is very fair to say at this stage, but very big test for them this Sunday against a very good Bills team. That's definitely a game that's going to have a lot of eyes on it. Obviously, a letdown spot for the Dolphins after their incredible performance and comeback win last week. Um, another team 
that had an incredible win, the Patriots, who are taking on the Ravens, who had a tough loss to the team that we were just talking about. And I want to just just say this stat again, because I don't know if I went through my takeaways from week two really quickly, but I found this on NFL.com. Entering week two, teams trailing by 21 plus points in the fourth quarter are 0 in 710 since 2011. Wow. That is wild. No team has ever come back 21 plus points in the fourth quarter since 2011. 0 in 710. Um, and the Miami Dolphins were able to do it. The Ravens obviously reeling after that loss. The Patriots coming back, winning against the Steelers. Mitch Trubisky might be done. We might be seeing Kenny Pickett. Who knows if that's going to happen. But your expectations, Jared, I'll come to you first for this one. Um, Patriots take it on the Ravens. The Ravens need to get back in the win column here. Yeah, I don't have much here. Market hasn't done much. Open three, it's still kind of hovering around three. Um, mm -hmm. And when there's no real definitive market direction, it's like driving a boat without like a rudder. It's like you don't really know where the smart money's going, so you can't kind of base your opinion off of it. Um, I'm yeah. sure there's going to be some interest for the Patriots at that key number of three at home. But I don't know, Tank, if you feel differently, nothing about New England has really impressed me so far. I thought they were fortunate to leave there. Pittsburgh with a win. Yeah, like they're just kind of a very vanilla, very bland team. And I don't think the scheme is as buttoned up because their, their talent's not as good as it's been in prior years, especially on the defensive side of the ball. Offensively, they were never really an overly talented team, you know, over the last few years. They just kind of gotten by with that grit and determination and some fortunate bounces and some good defensive play. But I haven't seen it yet this year. They kind of let Trubisky run around a little bit in the second half and made that game very close. And I, overall, I'm not really high on New England this season at all. So I, I don't really feel very inclined to back them in a bounce back spot you would think for Baltimore. Yeah, Tank, do you agree? Yeah, I mean, I feel like this is one of those situations where Whenever a team is going into New England and you have to play against Bill Belichick, you feel like it could be a potential trap game because, I mean, Bill Belichick, I mean, he's the mad scientist. I only had an opportunity to go up there and study underneath him for a year, but he really is a genius when it's, as far as like trying to game plan for a team, mm -hmm. try to take away their best asset and make, make it really difficult for you to navigate the ball down the field offensively to score points against them. But at the same time, like Lamar Jackson is just this special weapon that I feel like it's going to be really tough for Bill to just totally neutralize him. And that, on the flip mm -hmm. side, like the New England Patriots office, office, like we discussed, like they just don't have anything that scares you. The only thing that I can see a narrative playing out for the Patriots is that they're able to just run the ball with Damian Harris and Ramon J. Stevenson, just run the ball down. Baltimore's throat and just play bully ball, keep the ball out of Lamar's hand, keep it a low scoring game. And then that way they may be able to sneak out um, a win or something like that. But my gut tells me that the Ravens losing the way they did to Miami, they mm -hmm. go in and the wing, they handle business mm -hmm. and they let everyone know that they still are one of the better teams in the NFL. The Lamar yeah, they're gonna want to be too long. That's, that's a noteworthy mm -hmm. thing. Like he, he had a sleeve in practice this week and, I think he'll play, but it's like an elbow thing. Just that's just something to keep an eye on injury wise this weekend. Is it on his throwing arm? Yes. Is it on his throwing arm? He didn't throw. Yeah. We're we're taping this on a Wednesday. He he didn't throw on Wednesday. Um he didn't throw to any of his receivers on Wednesday. And again, it's Wednesday. He just had a tough game Sunday. You would think if he's fine, it'll change throughout the week. But from what we know now, that's something to keep an eye on this weekend. Tank, as an NFL player, how many days does it take for you to go from, <laughs> hey, we just played a game on Sunday, to my body's okay, to I'm ready to play again next week? Have you fully <laughs> recovered yet is, is really the question. Right? <laughs> 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 like, yeah, there, like there's some days I wake up and I feel like I just played yesterday. But <laughs> I would say this, like you feel better earlier in the season than late, but typically by the time – Thursday practice rolls around, you starting to feel okay. Yeah. Friday, you like, all right, like I'm good. And then you like ready to go for the game. But one thing I would say is this, like two things. Like Lamar not throwing is a little bit alarming to me. Like I hope it's not sure. a big deal, mm -hmm. but it really doesn't take a lot to go out there and throw on a Wednesday, usually because like Wednesdays are going to be your more run heavy practices anyway, where you're doing first and second down. And so if it's the Ravens, that's a lot of running the ball, nine or seven, stuff like that. So maybe that's not a big deal mm -hmm. anyway. 
now that I kind of talk myself through it. But when it comes to like him not practicing or participating in some things, like we used to have Steve McNair when I was in Tennessee. Mac Nine would get beat up on Sundays. He could barely walk into the facility, uh, you know, mm. Wednesday, Thursday. Man, they'll shoot that cap. They'll shoot him up on Sunday. They don't do a lot of that now, but they'll shoot him up with the toy doll on Sunday, and he'll go out there and play like Superman. So I'm really not worried about yeah. some players practicing during the week. As long as they suit up, hey, and they got the talent, I'm fully prepared for them to go out there and do what they can do between those white lines. And when this Lamar, that's B. Axon Jackson. I'm going through some of the tweets now, Lauren. Sorry, but it, it, it does look like he's going to play. There, there's no doubt he's going to play. It's just, yeah, but it's just that are you at 100%? That, are you the Lamar that's the 12 to 1 yeah. odds to win the MVP? That's the question at that point. The media so, noticed that he did not throw a pass to receivers during the media session of practice, and he was wearing a sleeve on his right elbow. That's, that's definitely no word. Again, yeah, it's noteworthy, but he's going to play this week. But you're right. He's not exactly known for his accuracy to begin with. So if there is even the slightest bit of, you know, mechanical difference with his throwing motion, I don't I don't know. Again, I'm just gleaning this from the tweets. But that is, I would say, slight concern to keep an eye on this. Week. Yeah, mm -hmm. a little concern. Someone I'm not concerned about after this last week is the Jaguars because they posted an absolute goose egg <laughs> against the Colts. They steamrolled and they took the Colts and they took a steamroller and just absolutely I don't know what kind of noise a steamroller makes, but that's what I feel like it would be. Nah, like steamroller <laughs> over nah. the court. At I don't this know point. what you're doing. That was not a steamroller. I don't know. I need to look up the house. <laughs> and then the Chargers. You're still on that coffee that hitch from team. earlier. God bless. I need help. I need help, honestly. Um, and then the Chargers went neck and neck with the Chiefs last week. That game obviously ended up being decided by three points. It all came down to the fourth quarter. Um, but the Chargers looked really good. The Jaguars looked really, really good. Jared, your expectations for Justin Herbert, 8-1 to one odds to win the MVP <sighs> coming into, into this game against the Jags, who this could be another letdown spot for another team. Definitely could be. Uh, the McRib is back. Justin Herbert's McRibs are in, in yeah. the spotlight this week. He practiced Wednesday. Um, I think he'll play. I mean, again, I've never had fractured ribs, so I can't speak to this. But the fact that he was on the practice field Wednesday, even though he was limited, yeah. Chase Daniel got the reps with the ones. But the fact that he was on the practice field Wednesday, I think is an encouraging sign. Um, monitor that situation very closely this weekend. Chase Daniels, a very capable backup. He's made like a gajillion dollars as a backup quarterback in his career. If he does start this line. He's had the best line, career. He's had the best I mean, he's career. He's made like $100 million I mean, and maybe taking 100 snaps. The dude's sitting on the bench with a clipboard. He's telling people what to do. He's making millions and making millions five of dollars. Making million a year. Wild. Do you want to know making one guy million. that doesn't need a total shot after every week? Chase Daniels, that's no. all I got to say about that. <laughs> he might, if he plays this week against the Jags defense, that's been a top five pass rush win rate team this uh, this yeah. season so far. But line analysis, very important here. It's been literally frozen on this key number of seven all week. Full disclosure, mm -hmm. I laid the seven, basically betting on him, Justin Herbert, to play. If Justin Herbert plays, I think it's very obvious that this line moves off seven, maybe not ten, mm -hmm. but – Seven and a half, eight, I think is a very fair assumption to make. At that point, it turns into a very good teaser game to go from seven and a half to one and a half. But I think in general, you have to question the Jaguars' consistency. This is a team yeah. that is six and 30 in their last 36 games, and four of those six wins are against the Colts. The Chargers are not the Colts. I, I just, I have a feeling the consistency with as good as Trevor Lawrence looked last week as good as the Jags defense looked last week, I'm guessing you're not going to get that high level of a performance against a, a, a Chargers team. Their defense is playing a lot yeah. better than it did last year, year two under Brandon Staley's regime. You would expect Keenan Allen to come back. That is a plus. Their offensive line has been fantastic. Slater, I think, is going to be healthier this week. He has been arguably one of the best young linemen in the league through the first two years. This is a Chargers team that I think – take away that pick six at the goal line, leave Kansas City with a win last week. And this, our conversation right now, again, about the Chargers is a very different conversation. I, 
this is yeah. a good buy low spot for LA. As long as Herbert plays, this is a good buy low spot for LA. This line was nine and a half two weeks ago. As long as Justin Herbert plays, I think the Chargers are a very good bet to make this week. To be honest with you, I've never had a McDonald's McRib. Tank, I don't know if you've had a McDonald's <laughs> McRib, but his McRibs are back several. and he's ready to go. What are your expectations for this game against the Jaguars team that uh, steamrolled the Colts? I have to get one <laughs> You just had to throw that back in, huh? <laughs> She's relentless, Hank. Uh, <laughs> I'm doing a show with her every morning. Relentless. <laughs> like, look, I, I will say this. Uh, I, have a, I have a few points. One is that that pass that Justin Herbert threw to set up the, the touchdown at the end of the game when his ribs already beat up. Yeah. If he can make a throw like that, I have a feeling that he's going to play. Like, that throw was yeah. one of the yeah. better throws that I've seen in the league. It's right up there with the Eli Manning pass, the Mario Manningham in the Super Bowl. Like, that's how great I thought that throw mm. was. That being said, I mean, the Chargers defense just looks unbelievable. Like, the way that they were able to contain Patrick Mahomes for so long, and it really took the Chiefs defense coming up with a play in order for them to win that game, that spoke volumes to me. But I have to give Jacksonville a little bit of credit. Like a lot of people were talking about Christian Kurt and the contract that they gave him going into the yeah. season. Like this dude has already earned his money in the first couple of weeks. And the thing that's kind of crazy when you look at it, you may have to squint a little bit when you look at it. <laughs> My man Trevor Lawrence and Christian Kirk doesn't it look kind of <laughs> similar to Justin Herbert and Keenan Allen. Like they aren't on that level yet. <laughs> but the way that he targets Christian Kirk in the intermediate and short game, but you can also beat a team deep. That's really how Justin Herbert and the Chargers use Keenan Allen. And the volume that Christian Kirk is getting as far as the targets on a weekly basis is just unbelievable. But I feel like the Chargers have enough on defense to apply enough pressure to Trevor Lawrence and possibly take away Kirk and try to force him to beat them another way. And then that's where the Jags may run into a little mm -hmm. trouble. So when I look at this initially, I see that in seven, and mm -hmm. I'm like, ooh, that's a lot. But as long as Herbert is healthy and doesn't, like, have to come out of the game, and as long as Keenan Allen is healthy, I think you can feel mm -hmm. comfortable about this, uh, about the minus seven, because I feel like the Los Angeles Chargers are one of the better teams in the league. And I felt like Herbert was my dark horse to win the MVP until he banged Oh, well, now you're just making friends with Lauren. She's going to love to hear that. <laughs> I love that's her I guy. last year at 20 to 1. <laughs> And obviously it didn't hit, but at the same time, I felt pretty good about it. Justin Herbert's my guy. Yeah. Love that guy. I have one follow-up for Tank, and I'm curious, yeah. because you mentioned something that rings true to me, and I want to get your opinion because it's a position I know you're very fond of. Is Derwin James the best, like, pound-for-pound -pound player in the league right now? I mean, that dude shut down Travis Kelsey. He is a yeah. problem. I don't even know what position he plays. Like, you can't even really put a position on him because he's everywhere. Yeah, I mean, so this is the way I look at it, and I feel like it's not talked about enough when you're talking about ball. The biggest mismatch in the game today is running backs like Christian McCaffrey and all those guys, and then tight ends like Travis Kelsey, Mark Andrews, because it's yeah. tough mm -hmm. for a cornerback to cover them because they're too small, and then linebackers and folks like that are just too big and too slow. So you have a chess piece like Duran James that can come down and play the run, and then he comes out of the middle of the field and like cover over the cornerbacks and stuff like that and give them help. But then also line up man to man and take away a dog like Travis Kelsey. Like that's a lot of pieces that most defenses in the league don't have. So I mean, he's a special cat, man. Like he's one of those cats. Like there's only a few select players that I call this, but he's Rick James and Cleats. He's a super freak, man. And when you got one of those cats on your team, like. And you got to pay them a whole bunch of money because they don't come around too often. Super yeah, freak, super freak, super freak, yeah. He's super you freak, yeah. Yeah, he super is. Freak, that yeah. was a freaky performance he had against the Chiefs. He's a, he's a dude. He's a dude. You Do can you tell the Chargers when, when, when he was out, they really missed him. They really missed him. when He, he had a season-ending injury, I think, a couple years ago. Total different defense. Yeah. Do you want to know who else has been super freaky through two weeks of the season? The New York Giants, they're 2-0, and something that no one ever expected. Wow. Brian Dable right. is, like, ensuring this. He, they're just locked in under him. Like, they have a purpose. They have a mission. They're ready to go. They're playing hard for him. Um, and they're taking on the Cowboys Monday Night Football. Week three ends. MNF showdown between the boys and the Giants. We'll see how that game goes. Um, Cowboys able to get a win in week two, even without Dak Prescott. 
Giants 2-0 in the season. Love what Brian Dable is doing for this team. They held Carolina, guys, to 275 total yards on offense. The Cowboys 15-5 and over the last 20 games in this rivalry, but I really do think that the Giants can pull off a win here. Um, Tank, I want to get your opinion on it because did you expect the Giants to be 2-0 and at this point of the season? Absolutely not, but I didn't expect the Titans to be 0-2, and I thought the Carolina <laughs> Panthers would be playing better ball, too. But the thing is that you can't help who you play. So right now the Giants are 2-0, and and they're playing really good ball. They have confidence, and now they have a Monday night game where they get to play at home against a divisional rival that everybody in America, except Cowboy fans, hate. And so then that's where we are right now. But, like, the thing to me is this, like, the Dallas Cowboys ran through the Cincinnati Bengals like they drank tap water down in Mexico. And that was hard for me to believe because, <laughs> to me, it was like, you understand that they don't have Dak Prescott. Like, how are you not going to stop them from, like, running the ball and, like, force Cooper Rush to beat you? But they were able to run the ball effectively. Cooper Rush was dialing them up to Noah Brown. Like, I really didn't understand that game. Like, the Bengals are like – I'm glad that we're not really talking about him that much because, like, the big ones just have me perplexed right now. And Michael Parsons is that dude. Like, and that's another thing. Like, in the Cincinnati Bengals game, like, it's it's third and four. Michael Parsons is lined up off the edge. They snap the ball, and he runs Scott free, like, tank the free. Front, like, Frank the tank, like, streaking to towards Joe Burrow. Like, you're, 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 like, your quarterback, the franchise. Like, how are you going to let Michael Parsons just run Scott free on the field. Like he got the Cooper Cup treatment. Like when everybody wonders, like, how is Cooper Cup that open when everybody in the stadium looking at him? That's how you should treat Michael Parsons. And he's getting that treatment towards the Cincinnati Bengals. So the Bengals got a whole nother thing going on right now. But I feel like this. If the New York Giants offense can eliminate Michael Parsons and make sure that he's not a threat, and Daniel Jones doesn't throw the ball to Trayvon Diggs because he's just itching to get some turnovers. Then they have themselves a chance. But the, the key to the Cowboys is going to be that defense. I did not – well, I knew mm -hmm. that the only way that they could win the game against the Bengals would have come and play lights out, and that's exactly what they did. So everything's still going to weigh on the shoulders of the Cowboys' defense, but I will say this. Cooper Rush impressed me. I was impressed that they were able mm -hmm. to run the ball effectively. I was, I was impressed that they were able to win without C.D. Lamb having a big game. So I don't know. Those Cowboys, yeah. they're a little scary right now. That's what I was going to say to Jared is Cooper Rush, man. Like, they might be okay without Dak Prescott. And when it comes to Trayvon Diggs, mm -hmm. we all know. I don't know, Tank. I hit I hit a prop last season. Oh, we stop. Them props. Plus money props. Oh, God. Trayvon Diggs over a half interception. And it hit, like, with two minutes left in the fourth quarter. And I still have not still on this a year, year later. A year later. one of the best props that I've ever hit in my life. Let me have it, Jared. No, that's hey. not the right attitude. And I love that you I love that you continue to dance year. on this head a year later. I love <laughs> Keep it. Keep dancing on this forehead. I love it. <laughs> so LJ and I have a very fun game where I like to disagree with her plops and then they hit and then she laughs at me the next day. That's basically our that's basically been our relationship for the last That's our year. relationship um, quite, yeah. Basically but the next day turned into the next year. <laughs> exactly. It's I'm living in a nightmare. It's like Groundhog Day. All right. Speaking of Groundhog Day, Micah Parsons, 15 pass rush win rates this season. By far the most in the league, but also more than seven other teams. Teams Complete teams in the entire league. That is how good this Cowboys pass rush, and you give Parsons a lot of credit, but there's another guy on the other yeah. side, Demarcus Lawrence, who's also very, very good. And you've got a very, very difficult Dallas defense to defend because, Tank, you know this, you can't double team one or the other because if you do, then the other guy's going to be single covered, and that is a very bad situation for whichever tackle has to go one-on-one -on -one against one of those guys. And the Giants' offensive line hasn't exactly been known for, you know, overachieving uh, uh, over the last few years. That's why you're seeing this total at 39. It's the only total of the week. The Bears-Texans one is hovering, but it's the only total of the week in the 30s. That's, that's pretty low in NFL standards these days. So if you like offense, this game might not be for you. But maybe Brian Dable can cook something up to neutralize some of that pass rush. And maybe Saquon Barkley is part of that recipe. He's looked rejuvenated. See, that's what I was about to look up. Weeks. Like Saquon Barkley props for the receptions. I think that may I be something. I think that is a fantastic into. way to look at this game. 
I think Daniel Jones is not someone that I'd be overly excited about in this particular yeah. spot. But Saquon's look good. And when you look at Saquon and then you add in a couple of these other weapons that have played okay for the Giants, listen, 39 is just comically low. You can't bet it under, right? Like you just you have to figure out a way to get some overs in there because the market is obviously shading mm-hmm. this game, the props, everything uh, lower than what you at your average number would be in an NFL game. So this is not a game I'm very excited to bet. It's a Monday night game. I'm sure we'll get to the window at some point on Monday. Um, but I, I would lean over, but – really tough with these offenses <laughs> i know it is really tough with the offenses um it, it, so you mentioned saquon being really good too and i know we're gonna get into some teasers here but last week i was looking up some stats saquon was only averaging like three and a half yards per carry which or per reception or whatever so it's just like he didn't even have his best game and they still are able to get the win so just when he plays well I mean, they're going to get a lot more wins this season. It's going to be interesting to see. All right, it's teaser time. Before we get into our best bets of the day, Jared, go through your two teaser bets that you have heading into week three. Yeah, this one seemed easy this week, and that means they're both going to lose, just like all three of our teaser legs lost last (laughs) week. But, but, But again, we stick to our rules. We like to take bigger favorites and get them through two key numbers. In this particular instance, it's two Mm -hmm. small underdogs, and we're pushing them up through two key numbers this denver san francisco game we haven't talked about it i'll briefly touch on it here it's a fascinating game i do think it's a buy low spot for nathaniel hackett i do think there will be improvements and i think the overall overwhelming nature of his first two games i think eventually he will settle into some of those decision making processes that he's obviously struggled with um through the first two games so you're getting denver now they, they were a favorite last week, very small favorite in this game. Now they're a small underdog. You're getting them through two key numbers in a low total game at home. And I, I talked to Lauren about this earlier in the week. I shared it with our, uh, you know, let's bet it audience. I'll share it with you too, Tank. You can agree or disagree. Earlier in the season in Denver, when the lungs are not fully up in the midseason form, that's when the altitude might play a bigger factor. So a tough San Francisco win against Seattle. Now they have to go on the road in a very tough environment with Jimmy G who hasn't practiced a whole lot. I I think Denver keeps this game close. And in the other one, I mean, how can I not take a full touchdown plus with Aaron Rodgers against the Bucks offense that no Mike Evans, Chris Godwin banged up, Julio Jones banged up, offensive line banged up. I'm not saying the Packers are going to win this game, but I feel pretty good in a very low total game hovering around 41 that it's going to be a close game and I trust Aaron Rodgers to keep things close. So that's my teaser this week, Denver getting seven and a hook green Bay plus eight. I'm curious, thank your thoughts on the Denver home field advantage earlier in the year. Altitude's tough, right? Because you're not really in mid season form yet with your cardio. No, absolutely. I mean, I feel there are some guys who get affected by the altitude more than others, but generally Mm -hmm. from a macro level, like the altitude does play a part. And if you're trying to find just a little bit of an edge, I think that can be something yeah. that you can speak to for sure. Yeah, even Fair if enough. you are in midseason form, like we're, I lived in Denver for three years, worked for the Colorado Avalanche. <laughs> Seeing some of these teams come in, and I know it's hockey, but I feel like hockey, football, basketball, like you're all using a lot of cardio. Baseball, not so much. I said that mm-hmm. earlier too. It's more of a stagnant sport. But when you're playing football, when you're playing hockey, like even when you're in midseason form, and then you go to altitude, it adds another level. I mean, like walking up a flight of stairs at altitude makes you winded. At least it makes me winded. I don't know about you guys. You guys are better athletes than I am. It makes me winded, uh, not at altitude. eh? (laughs) Okay, that's an issue. I need to get that checked out. (laughs) Just kidding. Um, A team that hasn't had an issue this season, Tank, I love your bet. I love your bet, and I'm tailing you on your bet heading into this weekend is the Lions. Taking on the Vikings. The first season, the first time this season that the Vikings enter as the betting favorites. Um, and the number is kind of pretty with how bad Minnesota looked against the Eagles on Monday. They were all, only able to generate 264 total yards of offense in that game. You look at the Lions, they're playing better. They're coming off a win to the Commanders. They want to build on that momentum. This is a team, guys, that I've been watching for 30 years that actually believes in themselves this year under Dan Campbell. Jared Goff had four touchdown passes. Tank, tell me why they are going to cover the spread with getting plus six in this game against the Vikings because I'm telling you on this 100%. 
Well, it's pretty simple. Like, Jerry Goff has been balling. <laughs> like, the dude yeah. has six touchdown passes and only one pick. Like, if, if you were to put his stats up against Matthew Stafford and then you don't put the name, <laughs> you would want to switch him. You would want to. But then, like, yeah, Jerry Goff, he's just been playing unbelievable ball. And I feel like the over on this, too, the 52 and a half, looks kind of good to me as well. But because I feel like the Minnesota Vikings are going to get back on track on offense. Like, I don't think this is going to be – an easy game for the Detroit Lions by any standard for this reason. Mm -hmm. Like, I've talked about it before. A.J. Brown on the Detroit Lions defensive backs. It's Justin Jefferson, he's that dude. And so if there's any team that you want to play to get back on track, it would be the Detroit Lions secondary. So I expect this to be a high-scoring affair. But the way that the Lions went into Minnesota and played the Vikings tough last year and stole a win, mm -hmm. and you look at the way that they've started off this year, where they were able to play the Philadelphia Eagles, who we now know is a pretty good team, and they played them with three, three points. And then the Washington Commanders as well, like they had them at home and they played them tough, and the Commanders have been throwing up mm -hmm. points on everybody. I feel like they're going to go into Minnesota, even though this is a bounce-back spot for the Vikings, and that's why I feel like they're getting so many points. I think Detroit goes in there, and they bite kneecaps and, and everything else mm -hmm. that my man Dan Cap is, and they, and, they, and they definitely cover in this game, I think. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. Detroit's 7-1 and one against the spread in their last eight games against the NFC. So something to definitely keep in mind. Tank, you mentioned the Eagles and the Commanders. Jared, I'm coming to you for this because I know this is your best bet. Um, the NFC East showdown between these two teams. The Eagles were absolutely dominant during Monday Night Football. It was so much fun to watch Jalen Hurts not only squatting 600 pounds, but also rolling his team to a win. Um, <laughs> Philly has won eight of their last 10 games in this rivalry. They are on a different level this year. They beat the Lions in week one, um, the Commanders in week two, and the or, and it's just, it's it's going to be a fun game to be able to watch these two teams go up against each other. I think the Eagles are going to dominate, but you actually like the Commanders getting the points here. Please convince me otherwise. Oh, I will do my best. First things first, um, to, to touch on uh, Tank's Lions pick, big Big injury news. Frank Ragnall looks like he's going to play this week, the starting center for the Lions. That's a huge, huge boost on the injury side uh, for Detroit. And I, I, I know you're big in the mythology tank. I'm on Ra St. Brown, the sun god. We need to get like some kind sun of sun god, god yes, merchandise for you, yeah. bud. Like that, I feel like that fits <laughs> your persona very well. We were talking Game of Thrones before the show. It all kind of, you know, fits into the gods and men and, you know, mythology vibe. <laughs> But uh, speaking of gods, Jalen Hurts was godlike in that game um, this week. And I'll be honest, I, I don't know if he can play better than that. I mean, you would think that, that he can. But that was about as dominant of a performance as I've seen from him. And the reason why it's looking a little more complete is because he's now willing to throw the ball over the middle of the field, which is not something he has done in prior years. Um, uh -huh. I'm starting to see a lot more confidence and comfortability with him pushing it into tighter windows, which again is showing the evolution of his passing game, I think in year two. But history says he doesn't do well on the road against divisional opponents. 0-4 against the number uh, through his first four games away from home against the NFC East. And, you know, say what you want about road games in the NFL. Home field advantage is not what it used to be. Divisional mm -hmm. games on the road, ugh, a little more starch behind them. So I'm curious to see if he can continue the unbelievable production that he had on Monday night against the Vikings. Can he replicate that against a commander's defense with Jack Del Rio at the helm of the defensive coordinator spot that has, you know, kind of held him in check at least, especially on the road where all of those key metrics have dipped in his performances against Washington. Now, the one thing I will say, too, about the Eagles defense, you want to talk about Jalen Hurts? I think he's fantastic. This offense is very dangerous. I think the Eagles defense has shown me some flaws early in the year. Take away the three picks from Kirk Cousins, because let's be honest, some of those were literally, I think he was handing it to Darius Slay. But yeah. the Eagles defense <laughs> is the lowest tackling graded team through two weeks, according to Pro Football Focus. And they weren't really tested against the Vikings. That A lot of that came again that game against Detroit, where they the Lions just ran it right <clears throat> down the Eagles' throats, and they made it very difficult to defend. I think we're going to see a little bit of that physicality from Antonio Gibson. Now, the Washington offensive line isn't as good as Detroit's, but they've got a couple of nice pieces on the outside. The tackles, especially Leno Jr. and Cosme, have graded out very well this year. I would not be shocked if we saw a lot of outside zone with Gibson. And listen, Carson Wentz has been pushing the ball down the field very effectively. 
and he's yeah. got three really good receivers on the outside. I, I don't like the matchup with Slay going up against McLaurin, but on the other side, Bradbury against Dotson, that could be very fascinating. And then you've got Curtis Sandler mm-hmm. in the slot. I think when you get to seven, this market has gotten too stretched. This line was minus one a couple months ago, and it was two, three before their big switch this week when the Eagles had their great performance in Washington, kind of fell flat a little bit in Detroit. So I, I think seven is a fantastic spot to buy Philly. I'm not saying they're going to or to, to buy Washington. I'm not saying they're going to win the game, but I have a feeling this game is going to be close because I just don't see the, the explosion on the road from Jalen Hurts like we saw at home. I could be wrong, mm-hmm. and if I am, then he's an MVP candidate. But I, I have a feeling this game is going to be a little bit closer than the spreads indicate. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how that one goes. The game that I'm looking at for one of my best bets, you talk about if you like offense, don't watch the Cowboys-Giants. Well, if you like offense, also don't watch the Packers-Bucks, something you never thought that you'd hear people say. Um, Aaron Rodgers going up against Tom Brady, two of the greatest quarterbacks of all time. This line moved, we talked about this earlier too, Jared, from 47.5 to 41.5, and and I still like the under here. I'm getting the under sweats at this point, but you know what? You got to risk it for the biscuit sometimes. The difference difference with the Packers this past week <laughs> was Aaron Jones. 20 carries, 181 yards, and a rushing touchdown. The Bucks' defense looks phenomenal, though. They won them the games against the Saints. They forced five turnovers. Um, what was it, like three interceptions, two fumbles. And the Bucks' offense, though, only had 260 total yards of offense. Now, this week, no Mike Evans, no Chris Godwin, missing a lot of pieces on the offensive side. And then you mentioned it too, Tank. Aaron Rodgers is missing Adams. He's missing him at this point. So these are two offenses with two great quarterbacks that are missing a lot of key pieces. And then a Bucks defense playing the way that they are. I like the under 41 and a half. Call me crazy. I'm going to be sitting there twiddling my thumbs, sweating this thing out. But you know what? It's still one of my best bets of the day. Best bets of the day. Um, and I don't know if the Packers offense can keep up with the Bucks defense. They're going to shut down their run game. I think it's going to be an extremely low scoring game. So that's one of my best bets heading into the weekend. Week number three, baby. Pixwise Playbook presented by Superbook Sports. Download the Superbook app or visit Superbook.com right now. And they are going to match your first bet, boys, up to 1K. Yes, that is $1,000 plus we're all rooting for safeties, said no one ever, but now we are. If you place a $100 pregame bet on any spread or total at Superbook and there's a safety score in any game on Sunday, you get a $50 bonus. So visit Superbook.com for terms and conditions and to sign up for the number one voted sportsbook in Vegas. Now available at the palm of your hands. Jared Smith living in Vegas right now. Um, and Vegas is capping this game Thursday Night Football, let's go into depth with it. The Steelers take it on the Browns, the battle between two solid teams in the AFC North. The Browns heartbroken on Sunday, coming off of a loss to Jarrett's Jets. I know, Jared, you lost a teaser, but your Jets still won. Um, They blew a 13-point lead in the last two minutes of the game. That's wild. The Steelers also found themselves in the losing column after last week, losing to Bill Belichick and the Patriots. Mitchell Trubisky, is he done? Is it time for Kenny Pickett to step in? I don't know. Tank, your thoughts. Steelers taking on Browns this weekend. Uh, when you look at the stats, I mean, it says it. Like, he's throwing up high school numbers. Like, Mitchell Trubisky threw for 168 passing yards. He had a one <laughs> touchdown in the pick. Like, that's that's nasty. Like, that's not NFL. That's nasty not NFL in a bad standard. way. And especially – Yeah, like, and, and, and when you draft a quarterback – that played in the same stadium that you're in right now. Like it only makes sense to me to go ahead and get that guy laced up. Now, that being said, you don't want to start him against a piss off Cleveland defense that's coming off a bad loss to the New York Jets. But at the same time, I'm not sure if this is the same Cleveland defense that we thought it was going to be based on the way that they mm. performed against the Jets. But um, all that being said, I mean, I expect this to be a tough matchup. It's a divisional matchup. It's on a short week. They're always going to be tough. I think that Cleveland's going to come out and try to do what they do. Let's run the ball down the Pittsburgh Steelers' throat. They don't have their best player. They don't have T.J. Watt, and they really don't have enough ammo or offense to get the job done. And when you look at it, even though the Browns play kind of bully ball, they're one of the teams that are scoring about 28 points or so per game in the league right now, so they're up there in, like, the top third. And I feel like the the Cleveland Browns losing the game that they should have won last week, Mm -hmm. they get it done this week. 
Mike Tomlin, Jared, knows how to beat the Browns. They're 15-4-1 straight up in their last 20 games against Cleveland. Wow. How do you expect this game to go? Well, Clowney's out. That's a big loss for Cleveland. Um, mm -hmm. I thought I saw some news on Garrett this week, but I think he's going to play. He doesn't have an injury designation, at least on the depth chart that I'm looking at right now. The one thing I will say, though, and Lauren, this will be music to your ears. I'm sure we'll talk about this on the show Thursday. Doppler radar. Get out the Doppler love, radar. Love We've Doppler got radar. wind in Cleveland. What a surprise. <laughs> Bad weather in Cleveland. Um, listen, Tank, I know you know this too, bud. Rain matters when it comes to quarterbacks and throwing the football. Wind is huge. I'm seeing 20 mile an hour yeah. sustained winds. Now, again, the forecast could change just like us. Meteorologists are wrong all the time. They're but not paid on accuracy, 20 mile... baby. They're not paid on accuracy. <laughs> thank, thank God we're not. If it is 20 mile an hour sustained winds throughout the course of the game, and my boy Tank just said Mitch Trubisky was putting up high school numbers in good weather, <laughs> give me some prop unders on Trubisky's passing yards uh, if it's a win game in Cleveland. Now, you could say the same thing about Brissett. I would say probably unders for him too. Just bet all the passing yard unders in this game if it's going to be one of those win <laughs> games and bet it early because we're seeing this total now. Wow, at 38. I thought the other game, the Monday night, man, what's up with the primetime games? 39 on Monday night for the total. This total is 38. Can we pick some better offenses, NFL? Jeez. <laughs> but, I, I mean, listen, it's tough to bet an under at 38, but I would say the passing yard props for Trubisky and Brissett, if it's 20-mile-an-hour wins, is the first place I would look. It's going to be interesting to see how this game goes. Um, both offenses known for their rushing game. I think this is going to be kind of a grinded out type of game. Steelers yeah. solid on offense ish. They already have six or seven yeah. sacks, though. or I mean on defense. Sorry, I said offense. I had defense. They have seven sacks. <laughs> in two games. Other side of the ball. Other side of the ball. And the Browns defense gave up defense. thirty-one points to the Jets, so it's going to be interesting. Um, okay, one more game to touch on quickly before we go because you guys made a bet at the beginning of the show that Jared is going to convince oh, Tank. To bet on the Colts this weekend, the Colts taking on the Chiefs. Um, that spread right now set at five and a half. The total fifty and a half. Why Jared should Tank bet on the Indianapolis Colts? All right, Tank. First of all, and again, this is just the way that I see the market. This line's moved significantly off of the three that it opened a couple months ago. It, I, I walked into a casino today in Las Vegas and bet a seven. Um, I, I think those sevens are gone now, and I think the reason why is we got word probably – someone probably caught wind that Michael Pittman and Shaq Leonard probably practiced on Wednesday, and Alec Pierce is the other guy, but really Pittman and Leonard are the two biggies, um, that those guys are going to be back for the Colts. Then you just get the fact that this is now going to be the third game under Gus Bradley's scheme, and Gus Bradley's defense is vastly different than what the Colts have been running for the last few years under Eberflus. They go from a cover two under Eberflus to now a cover three. Now, the irony is the defenses that have caused Patrick Mahomes the most problems over the last couple of years are these dink and dunk cover twos. But I think the cover three is interesting in this spot, and I'm curious if Gus Bradley ratchets up the blitz rate and the pressure rate because that's what Coach Bradley's known for. But against the Jags, they only pressured Trevor Lawrence on three of 30 dropbacks, which was the lowest of Trevor Lawrence's entire career. So I think there's a lot of upside here with this Colts defense. And they haven't played well through the first two weeks. They played okay against the Texans. They played very poorly against the Jaguars. This is a defense that has five pro bowlers, Gilmore and Gakwe. You've got Kenny Moore, who was banged up last week. The Forrest Buckner was also banged up last week. You would hope they're a week healthier. And then overall... The Chiefs' offensive line has had some holes. Now, I'm not saying that the Chiefs' offense is going to be shut down completely in this game, but I can make an argument that the Colts' defense is undervalued relative to what the market is putting them at right now and that Matt Ryan can't play any worse. <laughs> that would be the part of this that I'm a little concerned about. But yeah. I think there is upside with the Colts, and I think you're they're a very good team under Frank Reich. They're a professional team. They've been in the playoffs. I just I think you're going to start to see a little bit better play from them overall than what we saw last week. Tank, are you sold? Uh, no, but I will say this: I think that uh, I, I, <laughs> I know that was kind of quick, Fair. and I don't mean to disregard. <laughs> I don't mean to disregard your points, 
because I, I believe they are all valid points. Uh, and if Darius Leonard, Shaq Leonard comes back, I believe that's a huge boost to the off, uh, to the defense. 100%. Because I would say this, like I've been riding the Colts defense in fantasy football the past couple of weeks, and they've been disappointing me. So maybe that's why I'm a little bit jaded. Um, a little biased. But I will say this, like, right? But I will say this, that if they're playing single high safety and they're playing on blitz and Patrick Mahomes, that's exactly what he wants them to do. Because Patrick I'm Mahomes curious is going to know exactly where he wants to go with the ball. I don't know yeah. what that's going to look I, like. I feel like. Because Gus Bradley's a gunslinger, man. I mean, he might just go, screw it, cover zero. <laughs> Who knows? I don't know. Yeah, and then and, and then I feel like if you go cover zero against Patrick Mahomes, you have Travis Kelsey, who should be able to win his one-on-one -on -one matchup. You have speed guys like MVS and Miko Hartman that can get behind somebody, and then Mahomes just could just lob it up. Like, I feel like if you're going to blitz Mahomes, he knows where to go with the ball, and he can take advantage of you. I think the key, in order for the Colts to cover in this game, Matt Ryan has to play a lot better, which means that offensive okay. line needs to play a lot better. And if they do – then you're not going to even worry about Matt uh, Matt Ryan. You're going to worry about Jonathan, Jonathan Taylor, Taylor to take the, the ball the about 30 something yeah. times and then rush for about 150, 170 yeah. something yards and have like three mm. tubs or something like that. Keep the ball out of Patrick Mahomes' hands and then force him to try to play comeback on you. And then you can sit back and let DeForest Buckner and all those guys come after you, mm -hmm. Shaq Leonard, and then hopefully get your hands on a few balls. That's the recipe for success against the uh, against the Chiefs. I just don't think the Indianapolis Colts can execute right now just as bad as they looked the first couple of weeks of the season. You talk about cover zero. We got zero more to cover on this show, guys. That is it for us on Picks Wise <laughs> Playbook, presented by Superbook Sports, Jared Smith, Tank Williams, Lord Javar. Guys, this was Chapter 3. We'll see you next week for Chapter 4. Best of luck with your bets tonight. This is Picks Wise Playbook, presented by Superbook Sports.